Good morning, and welcome to The Review, the Instagram Live podcast where Kandama news, culture, and stories are shared over the warmth of coffee. I am welcome to The Review, MJR Kandama, the guy behind Kandama Depot. MJR is an event host, a community builder, and even a Kandama Kente sensei. We're going to be diving into what it takes to build a local community around you that plays Kandama. MJ's done it from the ground up. And we are super, super excited to dive into this. Uh, thank you to all of you guys who tuned into last week's episode with Matt Sweets as well. That one was a really special one for the review, one of our most viewed episodes to date within a seven-day period. It was really exciting. If you haven't listened to it, uh, go back and take a le- uh, listen. It had a lot of great content in there, a lot of stuff that you probably haven't heard from. We're gonna re- oh, there we go. We're good. We're back. Guys, we have some technical difficulties every now and then, but we stick through it for you guys. Anyways, guys, welcome here. Welcome here to The Review. I want to know, as usual, what are you drinking this morning? We always like to take a little bit out of our day on these Saturday mornings to shout out some of the community members here, to remember that this podcast isn't just about myself and the person I'm interviewing, but it's a community project together where we get to dive deeper into Kendama together. So let me know what you're drinking down below. I want to know. I'll let you know what I'm drinking. I'm drinking a Kenyan roast from Monogram Coffee in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, I brewed this this morning in my AeroPress. And here's the thing, guys. Uh, I actually could not find my other bag of coffee. I have a bag of Phil and Sebastian's coffee somewhere hidden in my house because I went and bought it like two weeks ago or a week ago. I was like, oh, I'm going to save it for this morning's episode. But I don't know where it went, so I got to go find it. <laughs> but let's see what you guys are, are drinking this morning. We got uh, Gandhi Lives drinking water. DJ Bones 2019 morning gang coffee, coffee, coffee. King Kendama, Death Coffee, the world's strongest coffee. Interesting. Uh, crispy at 10 FPS. Hopefully I can drink coffee today, but water. Uh, Toff Mama Dama with a hot cup of Samit Cafe. Guys, a uh, quick aside. Um, of all the cheap coffees out there right now, like to-go coffees, McCafe is probably one of my favorites. It's not, I'm not saying it's great. I'm just saying it's the best of the cheap coffees. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Naran Rajan, he's got the cardamom milk tea. Well, guys, hey, we are about to dive in here. We're going to cut right to the chase with MJ. I'm on my first cup of coffee, so I'm just gaining my energy this morning, and I'm excited for the interview. Uh, And one more shout out before we go, because I see that Kenya or uh, MP Page 88 is drinking a Kenyan from Onyx Labs with the AeroPress. I love Onyx Labs. They're an American roastery. Guys, if you haven't checked them out, go get their coffee. It is so good. With all that said, let's get them on here. MJR, let's dive into together. Because together is better. MJR! Yo, you, man? Yo, what's up, man? Thanks Dude. for having me, bro. How, oh my, thanks for letting me have you on here. Thank <laughs> you, sir. How are you doing, man? <laughs> Dude, very good, very good. Good, good. They, hey, there was a lot of love, a lot of hype and anticipation for this episode. I think I think this episode in particular has had the most love-filled comments dropped on the post of any episode what? we've ever released in no past. No way. So the people wow. love you, MJ. Dude, they... I love the people, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and yeah. we are going to be talking about that all today. We're going to be talking about what goes into building community because obviously from the comments section alone, you've done that, right? Mm-hmm. Like you can look at that and be like, this guy has people that surround him that appreciate the work that he's done and that they're willing to go out of their way to comment on some random guy's post being like, mm-hmm. I love this guy. You know, like that, that's symbolism to me. That's, that's me hearing that this is a guy that we need to dive into and find out what's he doing right and how do we replicate that in our local communities. Dude, but, word. <laughs> dude, I'm excited, man. You have no idea. MJR, before we dive in, though, I always like to ask a couple simple questions to get us kicking here. I want to know, what are you drinking this morning? So, okay, I ordered coffee. I I was going to try and get some coffee going for you. It didn't come in in time. Um, So I'm drinking water. But honestly, I don't really drink coffee or, like, tea or anything that often. Um, Just, like, water. If I drink enough Mm. water, I get, like, I get super, super, I get a lot of energy off just water alone. So, like, I don't even need coffee. It'd be, like, a little too much sometimes. So, MJR just water is just ascended beyond us all. <laughs> Dude, I don't know what it is. Water, like, it, I, I almost, it's, it does something to me. It does something. <laughs> but hey. water and some fruit. I got a pear. That's, like, the other pear. half. Oh, man. I haven't had a good, a good pear in a while. Dude, Canada kind of sucks in the winter because fruit is not, like, can, Canada in the summers, we get all the orchards from BC and you get really good fruit from out there. Uh, but during the winter, we just get all the like 
cheap stuff that we're just like pushing through all winter long to get back to the summer orchard stuff. Oh, yeah. But once yep. we're there, that stuff is good. But I, you know, I've been trying to drink more water. I've been trying to build better habits in my life this year. And I'm realizing I'm burning out in many facilities in my life. I was like, I need to start integrating healthier habits so that I can actually do the work that I'm being asked to do or you know, even doing this. It's hard stuff, man. Positive habits. Preach, preach. Yeah, I've been, I've been on the same journey this year for sure. Dude, okay, so right on. So not a big coffee guy, not a tea guy either. So that was a win for me. Um, secondly, I like both, but I'm not like crazy about both. But I'll give, you, I'll give it to you. I'll give but it you'll to say, you. But you would say publicly here on this podcast that you uh, like. Okay. Coffee, coffee for taste, coffee for taste, tea, because sometimes coffee is like, it agitates my stomach. It's kind of aggressive, you know? So coffee for taste, though. If I'm just trying to like have something, you know, that just for the taste buds, uh, I'll give it to you there. I'll take it. I'll take it. We'll, we'll let that one slide this time because we are, <laughs> we are just excited to dive into this today. Okay, second question I want to know. Uh, if you could teach any one person, past or present, their first spike, who would you want to teach? Oh, man. So I wanted to prepare for this because I'm so bad at these questions. But <laughs> no. when I was listening to uh, last podcast with Sweets, yeah. um, the first person that came to mind was Nikolai Tesla, uh, which is oh. like for not any particular reason, really just that he was like a really intelligent person and I'd want to hear what he thought about it because uh, I think Kendama was like the coolest thing ever. So, you know, yeah, just want to hear like that, somebody else's perspective that like I respect for other reasons. Yeah, yeah, Nikolai Tesla would be sick. That's a cool one. I haven't heard that one yet. That's right. <laughs> okay, third one. Third one I want to know is who is the most inspiring player for you today? Not today? not the person who got you into Kendama, not any of that, but for today, if you were to look back in the past week or so, you know, who's the most inspiring player right now for you? Um, well, I'll answer this as uh like as a whole, not just refer regarding their Kendama play, but Grove like period um mm. and I, di I didn't prepare for that but right when you asked it that was the first thing that came to mind um i look up to grow for a lot of different reasons so yeah andy's super sick at dama so um, yeah that's oh, the first been, person yeah yeah he's been doing some cool stuff this month uh with his girlfriend um i'm gonna forget her name right now austin, uh, remind, austin yes austin cheyenne uh, yes. they've been doing couples tricks all month long for 28 days later which is so cool and so unique you know what like quick aside 28 days later this year has been really really cool or 28 tricks later uh, because there's so many people that are doing it different than than years prior. It's not just doing like individual tricks trying to progress. There's so many people trying different stuff. You know, like uh, Haley Bishop is doing the 28 snacks later. Uh, you know, Ben Harold is doing the like stool tricks. Uh, there's <laughs> someone else doing something cool. Anyways, there's a lot of people doing a lot of unique things for 28 tricks later. And I think that's kind of the evolution that we're beginning to hit is that mm -hmm. we've been doing this for so many years now that we have to start thinking outside of the box of how we do this challenge. Are you, are yeah. you doing 28 tricks later? No, I'm not. And now I feel bad because like <laughs> I could have gotten a little more creative and made it more fun for myself, but I just thought it was better for me to focus like, cause it, it is a little bit of a burden uh, to have to film a trick every day. And I was like, mm -hmm. I just don't want that on my plate this month right now, just with uh, mm -hmm. other stuff going on. So I, I didn't. Feel that big I didn't. But it has been a really cool year so far. Like I'm really digging the creativity and the weirdness. Yeah, yeah I just noticed down in the chat two people, two other people that I've seen. And sorry, I forgot to, to mention them. But uh, Kazoku Nate, he's been doing car tricks. So he's been sitting in his car doing 28 tricks later while well in his car seat. And then uh, the other one was Goon. Goon's doing 28 stacks mm -hmm. later. He's doing Dama stacks. So it's like, guys, I love that kind of stuff. I love when people take something that's so normal and historic and then start to evolve it and make changes to it and improve on it and add different things to it. So it's super, super fun. But yeah. MJR, we are going to dive into a really fun conversation here today. I want to know a lot about your story, how you got into Kendama, and really what has built into your community and into your passion for the game. So much so that you decided to create this business called Kanama Depot, where you are now, you know, like quite well renowned within the community, or at least the sub community of a really dedicated fan base of Kanama for creating, you know, custom Kanamas, very, you know, you, you'll mix and mash and make Franken Damas or Franken Kens, as I called it, but I was totally <laughs> wrong there. Franken Damas, is uh, which is basically like a mashup of different brands of Kens and pieces to make you know, the ultimate setup for whatever it is. And I know there were so many questions people had about that, but why don't, why don't we jump back to the very beginning of, of your story? And, and I like, I've been asking this question more recently and I really like it. Uh, what was your life like pre Dharma? What did you do oh. before you were into Kendama? Okay. Um, pre Dharma, I was into skateboarding and 
a little, I don't know if I had started snowboarding at that point, but uh, I did play music like mm. way earlier, but like right before Dama, I was, you, you know, I was kind of like skater kid uh, type. Yeah. Kid. So were you in high school when you originally picked up Kanama or, or how old were you when you picked it up? Um, I don't remember how old I was. I know it was my freshman year of high school that I first saw it. Um, <clears throat> I think I missed the other part of your question. Uh, I was just curious when you picked up Kendama. Uh, yeah, so you, yeah. So you were 2014. In high 2014 was the first year that I found it. Okay, no way. So 2014. I'm trying to think of when I actually picked up Kendama. I think it was 2015. So you were in high school at the time, uh, and so you were just doing school. Were you a sports kid, or were you mostly just doing you know those subculture sports like skating and snowboarding? Yeah, definitely a subculture kid for sure. I didn't really yeah. like organized sports. Thought it took it too. <laughs> I was just trying to have fun, you know. Like and people were taking it really serious, and yeah, it's yeah. like, come on, we're trying to win <laughs> state championships here. Yeah, no, I was just I, trying to say. Yeah, yeah, no, for real. I, I, I didn't get super into organized sports. I did. I, I mean, I was, I was a bit of a nerd. I did cross country running, so I was like a long distance runner, and then I did baseball. I had no, no skill in baseball whatsoever when I started, but. <laughs> But I don't know, like my, my older sister was a big baseball fan. I looked up to her a lot. And so mm. I, I wanted to play baseball. And we moved to this school in grade 10. Uh, that was like where I started high school in. And they had a baseball league in their high school league, which was very uncommon for where I was from. And so there's actually in this like Southern Alberta district, uh, a baseball league. And so I got into that. But outside of that, I was a big BMX kid. I was mountain biking. Yo. I was doing all that kind of stuff. That was, that was the bread and butter of what I love to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and organized sports was like me just trying to pretend to fit in. Yeah. And, and I felt like I was forcing myself into that box that I didn't really want to be in. But you didn't actually enter into that box. You were just like, no, well, screw that. I'm going to skate. When I was younger, uh, like elementary school, I did play baseball. Um, eighth grade, they convinced me to <laughs> they convinced me to play basketball. Um, I grew up in a very rural, mainly white town. So it was kind of like this, this pressure of like, you know, man, like you'd be a great center. Uh, and I like the sport for fun. But uh, so yeah, then but once high school hit, it was like, no more, no more just like doing what I want for fun. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then uh, tell, talk to me about how Dama entered the picture. So freshman year is when you picked up Dama. What was that introduction like? So um, I feel like everybody like I wasn't I wasn't looking for it. Um, and, <laughs> no one's ever looking for Dama. Yeah, Dama comes yeah. looking for them. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. Um, so yeah, I saw some kids playing with a toy uh, in the middle of like lunch. There's like three or four kids like gathered around like squatting, you know, doing these, with the things in the hand. I was like, yeah. what's going on? So my, my friends were getting into fingerboarding at the time. And uh, as soon as I saw it, I made connection to that because it's like similar to the trick learning process of like skateboarding that I was into but without the risk uh so I was like I was like automatically interested in it and that was how I found it first and then I just went up and asked them and I was like what's good with it got like first big cup first spike whatever and then I brought it back mainly just to show my homies that were into fingerboarding um but then it, we all lived in a neighborhood so we all kind of just got into it together and that mm. was like yeah, that was those were like the golden days, man. Nobody, nobody like, because that's a whole separate era of my condom yeah. journey from like actually getting involved with the community. That was just like me and my friends, you know. Yeah, and that was that would have been kind of that. So when I look back at Kendama, it's it's been in, in North America for what about twelve years thereabouts with, mm -hmm. with Colin Sander kind of bringing bringing it to life about twelve years ago. I I think is about the timeline. I could be off by a year or two. Right. And it it, it went through a couple waves, right? It was like the initial introduction where there were some cool videos that were put online by Colin Sander that people picked up, and then Kendama USA, and then people got into it. And it really boomed in high schools for a season. And then it, it kind of crashed, right? It, mm -hmm. like, it went super quiet because everybody was just stuck on big cup and small cup. And, you know, they were learning basic tricks. But then there was a dedicated remnant who kept going <laughs> with it. And they were like, no, no, no. I think there's more here than what we thought there was. And then they began to explore it. And now we're in this, like, new era, this second wave or even almost third wave of Kendama. Yeah. Where we realized that we, there's still so much more to be discovered with this toy. Uh, mm -hmm. where would you say that you kind of fell into that journey? Were you in that silent space in between where you began to pick it up? Cause that, that's what it sounds like that 2015 era. Yeah. Um, so that was exactly what happened with my friends. Uh, they, we played, we all played with it for like a year or two and then they all stopped and I was like, yo guys, Kendama is still cool. But like once they stopped, uh, it kind of just like, I wasn't, mm. I just lost my drive for it, you know, um, for like a year or two. And then, 
2014, uh, I want to say junior, maybe senior year, I picked it back up and I was just kind of doing a lot of personal development at that age, you know, and I connected with it on a much deeper level. And I realized like how powerful it can be and how it can really help people learn like life skills. And um, at that point, I was like deeply committed to it. And that was like the first time that I really entered and even was aware of an online community. Um, So that was like the next step, you know? Yeah. Okay, cool. So you, you actually did let it go for a little bit. Like, yeah. What did you do in that gap time? Did you just go back to doing, you know, skateboarding, all that normal stuff that you were doing before? Nothing that cool, I guess. Cause I can't remember much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, it was a dark time. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. I'll tell you the truth. I was just smoking a lot of weed at the time. Uh, mm. So I don't remember a lot of that uh, very vividly, you know? Yeah. 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 Like so I what, wasn't, what... I wasn't like focused on anything at the time. Yeah. Okay. So, but, but you, so you're different than your friends because you gave it up like the rest of your friends, but you came back to it. What brought you back? That's what I want to know. Yeah, you, I mean, you, you quit. You went through this <laughs> whole other season where you don't even remember it. And you came back. <laughs> what does that look like? Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I was just doing a lot of personal development. And I connected with it on a deeper level. Um, and I, you know, I realized how much more it can do, not just for me, but like for people at large. And that nobody knows what it is. Uh, yeah, at that time, yeah, 2014, you know, mm-hmm. way less people would know what Kendama is just walking by them on the street and stuff. So um, I was like, well, this thing is really cool. I need to do something with, you know, with my life. And I want like, maybe I could just share this with people and make something out of it. Um, so that was when I started like community building locally. And uh, yeah, sorry, that answered your question. I don't want yeah, to go yeah, too. No, dude, go on, go on, riff. I love so it. <clears throat> yeah, uh, the first thing, so I mean, at that point, my old homies that were into it were just like, it was just was maybe I could try and force them to assess for a little bit, but like they weren't going to really get back into it. Uh, I did get some other friends at the time into it for another like year phase for them. Um, and during that time, <clears throat> I started going to local fairs and festivals uh, mm-hmm. and just like vending <clears throat> Kendama, like not with a brand or anything. Just I just wanted to show people Kendama, you know, uh, so so you that. did some vending though uh how did you set that up so did you just buy kendamas at retail <laughs> price and show up and like try and mark them up a little bit or, or Dude, how did you actually I, set that up i had to it was it was not easy to get kendamas wholesale at the time i think uh, actually sweets and kusa both told me no uh i think i needed like that you know they, mm. at, which is funny because i work with them now and like i've yeah. had so many good interactions with them but yeah um it was actually Sunrise over, I don't know if you you remember, like, Sunrise oh, Kendama. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, dude. Dave, I think it, the guy's name was Dave Mer- Merchant or Marchant. Um, yeah. He was super supportive. He was just like, yo, like, you're trying to spread Kendama. Like, why would I not give you some Kendamas? You know what I mean? So, yeah, uh, yeah I was able to get some wholesale from Sunrise, and then that would keep me, like, I would just have an abundance so that I could share it wherever I went or and or sell them at fairs or whatever, you know? Okay, and so then you went. You so you went out of your way. You you weren't even graduated high school at this time, right? You're no. you're still like what for, uh, junior year? You were saying when you started doing this? Yeah, junior senior year was definitely the first year. What the crap, man? Who does yeah, that was, in their junior I know. year? <laughs> no, I mean I just thought Kendama was that cool, and like nobody knew. Like somebody had to do it, right? I don't know. <laughs> did you get pushback <laughs> from your friends at all? Uh, did your friends pick it back up, or were you pretty solo in this operation? I was pretty solo. Like the homies that I got into it with originally uh, weren't really interested at all. Definitely no pushback or anything like they were of course supportive. Um, But, and then I got a little bit of help from that next set of homies uh, from high school that were playing with me a little bit at the time. Um, But it was a pretty solo operation. Like there was definitely times where I went to fairs and stuff solo. Um, Hmm. Just like some random, some random nerd trying to tell people how to play with this toy. Uh, At the time it was just so different, you know, now people kind of know what it is. So yeah, they'd be a little more open to it. Uh, but it was, yeah, definitely a different time. Dude, shout out to the people that put Kendama on their back and show up to fairs by themselves, <laughs> not even representing their own brand, not even, not even directly affiliated with Sunrise Kendamas or anything like that. Just a guy who loves the game so much that he rolls up and he's like, hey, man, I'm just out here with this other company's <laughs> products. Like, you, you need to play this thing that I play. It's that cool. Like, Straight up. Who does that? I don't know. I guess it was me. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. So junior year, you, you began this. How, was it a big hustle for you? Did you realize that that this was, you know, something that you wanted to keep doing? And were you making money? Or were you doing this just out of your the love of the game? Or did you see the profitability in it for you? Uh, somewhere in the middle. Um, that first time that I went to a fair, it was like, a I think it was a two or maybe three day fair. Um, and obviously, I had the best time teaching people Kendama for the first time, you know, this is like something that 
Because in my head, yeah. like, mind you, I had watched some videos at this point of like communities, like people with, where there was large groups of Kendama players together. And I was like, dude, that would be like, that's what I want, you know? So I was like, that was my mission. I was like, I'm trying to maybe show other people and then they'll get into it and we can all hang out and play Kendama. Oh man, I lost my train of thought. <clears throat> what was Keep the question going. I was answering? Uh, yeah, were you, were you making money? How was the hustle uh, going? Was that, was that going so, well for you? Like, after at that first event um i remember i walked out of it with like 300 dollars profit and i was just like mm. mind blown because that was my first entrepreneurial endeavor you know and i had such a good time i had like a crappy uh job as like a busser uh where they did not show me love um <laughs> and comparing it to that like how much fun i was able to have in the process uh, and probably make more money doing that in, a, in i mean there's so much other work that goes into it right it's like it's not like you just show up make 300 dollars. it's like you know weeks of prep it's hours and stuff. Definitely, but, but in, definitely in a day it's like when you make 300 dollars in a day for for the first time ever it's like that's a pretty good paycheck yeah no so it was uh definitely like a very it, it that was when i i think i got my first hook in entrepreneurship and i was like i definitely want to work for myself and create my own yeah. lifestyle or whatever you know so um but yeah i mean I never really saw, I didn't see the money in it because there wasn't a market at the time, you know, like there was no, there, it was hard to get a few people to buy a Dama at the time. So I just didn't, yeah, there wasn't as much money in Kendama. So I definitely didn't see it at the time. It was more so just hoping to build a community. <clears throat> yeah. Do you remember your first fair that you went to? Do you, do you remember it really vividly and clearly what it was oh, like? Oh yeah. Oh what yeah. What was going definitely. through your head there? Um, it was like definitely a little nerve wracking. Um, you know, it was, <laughs> I guess this is a reoccurring theme I'm starting to realize now, but like, um, I don't know, I guess I have always felt, I've, I've often felt mis uh, misunderstood in my childhood, uh, just like because of the environment that I grew up in. And so that town in particular was like even more rural and like even more white. Uh, so it was definitely a little intimidating, uh, knowing if people are going to be receptive to it, knowing that like nobody knows what Kendama was anyways. I don't know what the hell I'm doing in terms of like, you know, entrepreneurship or business or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, definitely a little intimidating, but I fortunately had a good homie that was with me. Uh, shout out Jake Hughes if you're watching this. I uh, appreciate you, bro. Um, and that made it that made it a lot better. But yeah, I mean, I wasn't like, I was just kind of there to see if anybody would would stop and and ask you know like i wasn't like trying to like grab people and force them to play kendama <laughs> <laughs> a little little bit honestly a little little more than i should have but um so like whenever somebody genuinely walks up to you and wa it shows interest in kendama that's always a fun time you know what i mean um yeah so yeah it was a good time it was a super good time that's so cool do you remember one of your first customers or do you have a story of like who was mm, the first person that picked damn. up a kendama from you do you remember that no i don't oh that would be awesome but uh, but mind you, I did I had probably given or sold some damas just from like personal networking uh, before right. that point. So I don't know what would be technically the first. Right. And yeah, I don't know. I don't remember all the details uh, about the fairs, but there was a lot of people there. That's for sure. Yeah. Do you, do you have a memorable first customer at all that that you were like, wow, I was so stoked on that person? And do they still play today? Do you know? No um they don't but i do remember like the first kid that picked it up and was like <clears throat> actually into it for like maybe like a week or so after he started posting some videos on instagram i was like oh sick like he's gonna be the one that gets into it and we're gonna hang out all the time and play kendama um he didn't end up sticking with it but i definitely remember that and then just lots of families you know just lots of random families that uh just thought it might be a cool thing to have around you know yeah that's so cool. Okay, so this was junior year. You started doing this this event hustle, just traveling around to events. How did you even set those up? How did you find those? <laughs> Were you just Googling like, hey, what kind of toy fairs or trade shows can I set up in? And did you have a fear that you were going to lose money? Because from my understanding, a lot of those events, you have to pay to even be there and have a booth, right? Like, yeah. what did your booth look like? Give, it, give me a picture of what <laughs> Dude, I... Dude, I If I were to I roll up, one. what would I see? Um, yo, so super sketchy uh you know one of the what's it, what's it called those tents you know the the pop-up tents super sketchy yeah. um with paper like just printer paper on for one for each letter k e and the, like boring text you know what i mean taped on like flapping in the it barely said kendama half the time you know but um and then just me sitting in front of a table with a whole bunch of kendamas on it that was really it <laughs> 
cool. So, okay, so maybe let's fast forward a little bit uh, and jump into kind of later events. So how many did you do in your first year? Do you remember or like a rough approximation of like, did you do a hmm. lot of them or was it just a small handful? Oh, of events. Um, hmm. I don't know, honestly. But I know I might have only done one, like... I remember the first one was Hamburg Fair. And I remember I did that a couple of years uh, following. And then after the Hamburg Fair, there was a couple in between. Um, but I don't remember how many exactly I did the first year. It wasn't many, though. It was only like a few times. Because it, it wasn't like something that I was doing like seriously. You know, it was just like, yeah, I guess it was. I was pretty. But it wasn't like I was making money or something off it. So I was like needing to do it every, as, as often as possible. It was just like whenever it lined up, you know. Mm -hmm. So were you doing something else on the side then to supplement your income at the time? I guess you were still in oh, high school, so it wasn't really, I, I don't know if it would have been your main priority, but what, what else were you doing at the time? Other entrepreneurial things? No, no other entrepreneurial things. I was just doing school as little as I could and <laughs> <clears throat> hanging out and what's it called? Working. Uh, I had a job as a busser at one point and then a job as a customer service rep uh, for a call center, which was pretty bad. Not a fun job, but like ended up being some really valuable skills I learned from there that are directly channeling into the depot right now. Like I credit yeah. that like, almost 100 percent for <laughs> the depot. So, um, yeah, that was what I was doing besides the Dama stuff. Dude, I didn't think I could ever have a bad day if you picked up the phone when I'm calling in about complaining Yo. for a product. I'd be like, oh, it's MJ. Just kidding. Dude, everything's fine. I don't need this toaster. It's cool. Dude, I was good. It, my was house good. is on fire, but dude, you, you've really served me well today. <laughs> yeah, no, I had a lot of fun with it whenever I could. Some people weren't, you know, so receptive, but I learned a lot of life, uh, like people skills there, you know? Yeah. And like you know, problem solving, you know? Yeah. Okay. So to take us a little bit through the journey here. So you started, you know, doing these fairs you know, hustling for sunrise kandamas on the side. You're not even, did you even have a brand or a name for what you were calling your, your hustle or anything like that? So, no. so okay, when did <laughs> you, what was the next step that you took to becoming a little bit more official? So uh, after that point, <clears throat> I think it might've been the second year uh, that I was doing the Hamburg Fair. Some people, some other people in Connecticut, um, I'm based in Connecticut, some other, two other people in Connecticut that, all, that were already into Kendama. So at that point, I had discovered Ken YC, I think. Um, <clears throat> and they were like the community in New York City, which was a little bigger at the time and more developed. They, had, uh, they definitely had some events and stuff going already. Um, but that is, second is year... That, who, who, is that Austin Donovan who runs that community? Um, Austin was definitely a key part of it, but I think it was mainly run by a couple people who aren't very involved right now. Uh, DJ Panic and okay. Alan Young, oh, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I remember DJ Panic. I saw yeah. him perform at uh, NA or MKO twenty eighteen. I was like, dude, that guy's sick, bro. He, he, he has is some sick. cool moves. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, but it's so yeah. Then I I met some other people in Connecticut that played. So now I actually started to build uh, what was like a community locally. And then once I found other Kanama players, it was like, all right, forget like trying to, you know, preach and recruit all these people and like force them into this, into Kendama. Um, I'm just going to try and create, like focus on creating a space for existing Kendama players that mm. makes it better for them and makes it more sustainable and more enjoyable, you know? Yeah, it's super interesting. So, you know, uh, you listened to last week's episode with Matt. Matt was talking about how they shifted their focus from the 1% of hardcore Dama players to the 99% of the world that don't know Dama. But you mm -hmm. almost took the opposite approach. You were like, you know, I was spending so much effort trying to recruit these non-Dama players, but you saw this need within the community itself to optimize and improve their experience and their play. And mm -hmm. that was the approach that you ended up taking. Yeah. Super interesting. So yeah, uh, keep keep journeying me through. I just that was a little connection point that I was like, oh, that's cool that you, yeah, that you is chose funny. a totally different strategy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. That is interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just like more fun. Uh, you know, like, mind you, I wasn't a business at the time, you know, like, yeah. we're, we're also going from totally different perspectives. Um, me and sweets, that is. So I was just trying to like, that was my main goal in the first place was just to get other people to play Kendama with. So um, <clears throat> yeah, I forgot where I was going again. Yeah, I do that so, a lot. Yeah, the, the official, you were, you were getting more official. You started focusing on the community in Connecticut. And, and what did that look like, the development there? And, and what, you know, like bring us kind of closer towards where Kendama Depot is today. You know, what was the journey to what it is? You know, some mm -hmm. other events that you were doing. Love, I love the story, though. This is, 
This is so cool. Yeah, I, no, I'm glad first, that you're letting me go like real deep on like the, dude, in the beginning. Dude, the people love it, man. I, I love the deep dives into building the, the, the business. Hey, I love business uh, in general. I love the story of how people built their, their brand and Kanama companies and Kanama brands and the smaller ones, bigger ones, whatever it is. Those stories are so cool and they're so inspiring to me and it's so inspiring to our listeners too. I know that because it's like so many people afterwards are like, man, I think I could do this. I think mm -hmm. I could start something. And I'm like, that's what we want at the end of yeah, this. It's like absolutely. someone leaving this conversation going like, oh, I, I've i learned something. I can do something and I can build something. That's what I want at the end of every episode and every conversation that we have. So this is so cool to me. Sweet. Cheers. So I will try and pick up. I'll, I'll start moving a little faster though. Um, So... Yeah, I met two other people that play Ikendama, Fernando and Panda. Um, and we started hanging out. And then my buddy Jaden was also super into Dama at the time. So um, us four were like the first like crew in Connecticut. We actually made one of those, you know, one of the, one of those little group pages. It was mm -hmm. Connecticut, K Connecticut. Clever. Didn't, <laughs> didn't really, you know, it didn't really stick. Um, but that was where it all started. Um, Shortly after that point, Lunatack. I don't know if you remember Lunatack. Yes, I do. Uh, yeah, um, Lunatack. Steve. Steve uh, no, no, was Diaz. It Steve? Diaz. Yeah, Stephen Diaz. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Lunatack put me on their influencer team. Uh, I guess he just saw stuff that I was posting and was digging the vibe, and so he put me on their influencer team. Through that, when he made the announcement video, then I met some other people in Connecticut that were into Dama. So now it was really starting to like be become a bigger group. A, a, like come uh, emerging of different groups of Kiana players within Connecticut. Now we're all coming together. So that was when like, it really started to feel like community. And I was focusing more on like events, almost uh, not very official events, but like, you know, bringing everyone together and doing some competitions, uh, you know, getting prizes and stuff and uh, just having a good time. So what you, you were put on the lunatic, a lot of a lot of the newer players don't know what Lunatac is. Uh, yeah. So you were put on the influencer team of Lunatac. Uh, what did that mean for you in doing your hustle with Sunrise Kendamas? Did that fade away during this season of your life, or were you still doing that? Um. So, it, yeah, somewhere in that area, I wasn't like I wasn't really like affiliated with Sunrise or like committed to them. Um, mm -hmm. You were just buying and reselling. Right. But like, whenever companies would have like a fifty percent off sale that was the same thing as buying wholesale, you know? So right. I would sometimes like, for example, when Kenko went uh, out of business, I got like, I think like 300 damas from them. So they, they were like $3 each though at the time. Yeah. Uh, or, I don't know. Maybe it was a hundred damas. So I paid $300, but yeah. anyways, um, I would just get, I just wanted to have an abundance of damas at any time, you know? Um, the, the, amount of people you of the, just, yeah. the amount of people you just made super guilty there by telling them like, yeah, I just got a hundred damas at three dollars a piece. It's like we're all we're all out here paying forty five bucks for a kendama. <laughs> I mean, it was like unreal. Like I was like, why wouldn't I get a hundred? You know, I'm gonna hand them out to yeah. a ton of people. Um, if that was a thing now, I'd probably do the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So okay. So you you kind of did slow down on the hustle a little bit, but you were you were still picking up a couple deals. But you you ended up going on the influencer team for Lunatac. Talk to me about that and what that was like and what did that even mean? Like, is that the same as a pro team sponsored? What what did that look like for you? So for also one, tell us for, about Lunatac. Yeah, just for some reference, Lunatac uh, was a Kendama Innovations company. Uh, it wasn't directly like their main product wasn't selling Kendamas. Their main focus was selling things for Kendama, whether that be, um, dude, these, these, uh, these messages are so distracting. I'm like, always, <laughs> I need to block it. Um, and so, yeah, their, their main product was actually called Lunatac. It was like this silly putty mm -hmm. that basically had like metal in it. And the idea was you could put the silly putty on different parts of your Dama to make it weighted better for certain things like Lunars. Yeah. I, like, if your cups are heavier, you're going to have better Lunars. And if your sword is heavier, you're going to have better Slingers. Um, so they were, you know, they they also had this thing called uh, sleigh bands, which were like these little yeah. rubber bands that you'd stick. You'd wrap up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, things that never really stuck in the community. Um, and I think Stephen was just like exploring, which I think was really cool. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that was Lunatac. Uh, they put me on their influencer team, so they had a Slayers team and an influencers team. The Slayers are more like uh, what you'd think of as a typical sponsored player, you know, very high skill leveled. Um, but the influencers team was more just like people that were doing innovative things with for or within the community. Um, <clears throat> so 
that meant a lot. I mean, that was the first time that I really got any sort of like public recognition for what I was doing, you know, because like you were saying, like, I was just kind of doing this stuff just because I wanted other people to play with, you know, I wasn't trying to like get anything out of it. And um, so that meant a lot. And then it connected me to more people. And then it allowed, you know, for the Connecticut scene to develop more. Um, so yeah, I think I answered the, the next two. Yeah, that's super cool. So who was on the, the Slayers team? Give it give us a little picture of what that team all looked like. I remember I, Marcus. I only, yeah, Marcus is the only one I remember. <sighs> who else? Oh, man, I know I'm doing also, somebody for those, that, those of you that don't know who Marcus Todd is, I, I don't know if he's still posting a ton, but go go look through his old stuff. He's so lunar honed. Like, that, that's um, his thing. He's, like, incredibly Penguin, good. Inward Lunar King. I, I yeah. think we could still claim that. And he hasn't been posting for a while, as far yeah. as I don't know. Crazy Slayer. Go check him out yep um i don't remember who was on the slayers team ah, i know that like i can remember a face with somebody but i don't remember their name um but i know that alex i don't know if it's guzman or guzman i think it's guzman that sounds i like guzman um was also on the influencers team who else yeah i, I, I i'm sure someone else. like austin donovan down in the chat will let us know yeah somebody <laughs> somebody <laughs> right on okay cool so you were on that team what did that look like what did that actually mean for you to be an influencer on the team did you get free product mm -hmm. what what mm -hmm. did that relationship with lunatech <laughs> actually look like it was super chill um i don't think there was maybe this maybe the slayers team had different you know requirements because i mean that was more of like a sponsored player thing where they uh would be posting bangers that hopefully the, the, the brand could post. Right. Um, whereas we were just like, he just wanted to support us. Um, he wasn't really making a ton of Dama. So it wasn't, there wasn't much of a relationship that way. It was more so I think just for promotion than anything like mutual promotion mm -hmm. of each other. Um, I think we definitely got some of the free products, but you know, I don't know the, the, I wasn't like super crazy about the lunatic like using the lunatic or the, mm -hmm. the slave bands anyways, it was, but it worked out really well in terms of just like giving me a little more of a platform. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. But they, they came out with actually like a slapper of a Dama too. I remember that did happen. Your, that did dude, happen. The give a Dama. Were you still on the team when the give a Dama came out? Yeah. Yeah. Dude. I do remember that. Okay. So Those when I actually really fun, they were so fun. <laughs> yeah. I, when I started Kanama, that was like the Kanama that I was upset that I missed out on for the first batch. And then I got the second batch. So uh, the only downside to those Damas was the, the, the Serato was so thin. My cups literally it looked like a, I had a Hobbit at the end of the day. Like, you know, that my cups were so pressed down. I think I still got it so, uh, somewhere. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll post a, a story up afterwards uh, with a picture of my Give a Dama. But it's, it's literally like, I don't know. It's like, it's so small. Little hippopotamus. But anyways that that dama was so cool that was one of the damas that really really got me into kanama and really expanded my ability to do lunars it taught me a lot and so i was a big fan of lunatic as an early kanama player and so steven diaz even signed one of my kanamas for me because my friends went to mko without me because i wasn't you know i was in college at the time they were mm -hmm. like hey you want me to get your a dama for you and get it signed by a couple people i was like i'm like a, a little grom back in the day and I'm yeah. Like, yeah of course uh and and they, they got it signed by, I think, uh, Steven Diaz, uh, Max Norcross, Reed Stark, and mm. maybe that was, or maybe TJ Kolsnick or something like that. I don't remember. I don't remember who all signed it, but I had one Dama that was just signed by all of these guys that I, I didn't even meet. <laughs> that's awesome. That, yeah, that's some Grom, grom stuff. Very sure. Grom. <laughs> <laughs> that's dope, though. Dude, yeah, okay. no, the Give It On was very sick. So cool. Do you still have any? Ah. I don't think so. Cause there were people that were super crazy about them, you know? And so if I did have extras, like people were hounding for them. So I don't think I have any, I, I should, I, I kept some of the Tamas cause I do keep, you know, bits and pieces of uh, my Kendama journey, you know, like I have a couple of the Tamas, but like, how could I need, I should have kept the Ken. I, I didn't see it. The Ken was there. the best part of it, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, so cool. Okay. Hold on. I, I do want to move, move towards the Kendama Depot piece here, but, and I don't love stirring up controversy very often, but every now and then I like to, to just pose a question. Uh, right. What did you think of the the double big cup? Uh, the mm. what was what did they even call it? The oh, was that Lunatech? Yeah, it was the Lunatech. It was the last Kendama that they ever released, and then basically oh, after the that loon. they went bust. The Loon, yeah, yeah it was just yeah. called the Loon. I vocally oh, was not supportive of it. Like I, I, I remember when he was pitching the idea, I was like, I, that literally takes an element away from Kendama more so than it adds to it. I think. Um, you know what I mean? Just because, I mean, you have three different size cups or now you have two different size cups. Um, so I, obviously it's like cool, you know, it's, it's not a problem or whatever, but I just wasn't super into it. Like I, I would rather play a Dama that has a small cup. Um, and now here we are and we're getting close to that. You know, a lot of small cups are very close to the same size as big cups, but still they are smaller, you know? 
Yeah. Did so? Did you play one yourself? Were you still on the team when that came out, or was that were you gone by then? I th- I think I know I had a few. So I yeah I probably was. Um, and he he marketed it really well, and then the reception afterwards was not the best. Which is yeah, he, it's re- it was a really unfortunate piece, right? I yeah. I bought two of them because he had the dude the guy the guy was actually really clever with his branding and marketing. Like he he was smart. He was mm-hmm. he was a very smart guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I miss him in the community. I wish, I wish he was still doing stuff and, and too. creating stuff. I, wanna, I, I, I wonder think what he would have innovated. To. I know, I don't know. Uh, but guys, we got to hunt down Steven Diaz. But anyways, <laughs> basically on his launch, uh, man, I bought in. I, it was so much FOMO for me because he created this landing page uh, for his Kanamas, and it was like buy one get another free or fifty percent off or something like I that. I was like, I was like, what? Because I remember him explaining this to us before he did it, and I was like, what do you mean? You're gonna tell people that it's a seven dollars, seventy dollar Kandama, but they are getting two. I'm yeah, like, so then it's just a thirty five dollar. <laughs> yeah, like. But it but worked, I guess. It, I guess it worked. It, on it got me so good. <laughs> and I was like, because I love the Gimadama. So I was like, my whole mm-hmm. idea of Lunatac was like really high quality Kanama, innovative. It's like going to unlock so much for me. Because when I had the original Gimadama, it literally unlocked Lunars for me. That was the Kanama that that opened up the the Pandora's box of being mm-hmm. able to do tricks for me. Yeah. So I had so much love and respect for that brand. And then mm-hmm. I got the Dama. I played with it for a little bit. And I was like, ah, I'm not super into it. I played it for a bit. I actually think I still have one somewhere in, in my room in, in an old box or I gave them all away. I don't, I don't really remember anymore. But Dude, rest in peace, Lunatac. I I'm sad that that was their end because it was it was genuinely such an innovative company. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I know that he is and was a serial entrepreneur, so I think that he has like multiple other things going on. Uh, and Kandama was just something that he was tapping to do for fun, you know, more so than like trying mm-hmm. to make a living off of it. Uh, so I, that's why he just like kind of put it down. Um, he probably just had other stuff going on, but yeah, it was, I, it was really cool. I'm obviously super grateful. Uh, and I think that, yeah, it was good times. It was good times with an attack. Yeah. Okay. So, um, let, let's take a little break here. Let's answer some questions and then we'll dive more into the Kanama Depot story and Sweet. we'll kind of work towards the event building side and community building in, in the latter half of our conversation here. Um, we, we like to jump through our Patreon questions and then hit some of the ones on the post and then we'll, we'll try and hit as many from the live as we can here and we'll, we'll hammer through them as we can. Um, so a couple questions from some of our Patreon subscribers. If you guys aren't a Patreon, you can uh, sign up for $5 a month, and that gets you behind-the-scenes access and priority questions for the review. And it mm-hmm. also just keeps this show going, helps pay for the website, and it helps create new content and, and merchandise and stuff like that. Anyways, I'm in, bro. Check I'm, I'm, I'm going to subscribe. I'm gonna subscri- is it subscribing to Patreon? <laughs> I'm going to subscribe. Yeah, it's a, it's a $5, $5 subscription. It's yeah. literally my only income, guys. Help me. I'm just kidding. Don't. <laughs> I, I it's like like follow subscribe hit that Patreon. That I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> All right. Um, question here from Bray Dama. Uh, he's the owner of Sweets Kanamas Canada. Uh, he wants to know from the guy who literally plays with every Kanama shape possible in his depot. Uh, what is your favorite shape? So I'm so I don't like to do favorite questions because I look at things very analytically and see like there's certain things that I like for this reason and certain things that I like for that reason, like the coffee question, for example, like, you know, coffee for taste, tea for like maybe health. Mm-hmm. Right. But anyways, um, overall, I, I would probably say Quill Kestrel right now. Um, mm. I'm a big fan. Yeah, it feels really good in my hand. Boost was my favorite all around shape for a while. Um, but I really like the Kestrel. Yeah. I, would, I, I was going to try it. and grab my Kestrel, but it's over on the other shelf over there. Uh, uh, sorry. Okay. So Quill Kestrel, that, that one's your favorite. What, what is the, the defining feature of the Quill Kestrel that you love the most? Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. Like, I can't say that it is a specific, you know, feature about it. Um, I think everybody just has a different hand and certain Dama's like, yeah. some people's hands just fit a certain Dama right and they don't even know why, you know? It's not necessarily because of a, a literal thing about it. Sometimes it just feels right in your hand, you know? So I think it's more so that. Uh, it's not like the, it's, it has the biggest cups or anything mm-hmm. super unique. Um, but yeah, it just feels right. It feels, it's like yeah. it's smooth. And you're, you're totally right there too, right? Everyone, everyone has a different hand. Everyone has a different play style and feel. It's like when people are like, what's the best Kandama I can buy? It's like, well, that's a dumb question. It's yeah. not a dumb question, sorry, no. for anyone who's asked that question. But, <laughs> but, but the question is really misguided, right? It's mm-hmm. like, what is the best Kandama for you is probably mm-hmm. the better question you should be asking. And, and understanding your own play style and what's going to fit your play style as best as it possibly can. And that's, that's the money spot you want to get to. There's no best Kandama, at least in my opinion. No, Anyways, yeah, straight up. 
Okay, second question here from the official deep purchase, Danny Purchase, longtime supporter of the show. What is the craziest slash most unique Frank and Dama you've put together for a customer? Hmm, this question uh, was asked by a bunch oh of people. Man. But... I shouldn't even be. I, oh man. We're opening up a can of worms that I don't want to open right here. But there was one exception where I switched some swords and some cups for somebody. I do not. We do not do that. We're not doing that. Uh, but I did it once. Uh, and that was probably the craziest one. I think it was Matt Sweet's sword, uh, a decade cups, and then some other Tama. Ooh, interesting. So why, why did he want that or she want that that way? Maybe that wasn't it, but... I don't. Maybe yeah, I might be remembering the exact uh, mashup wrong. Do you do you oh, remember the splice. reason? It was the splice. It was mm. the splice cups or spike because it had like the walnut stripe on the sword and then the the wenge uh, <clears throat> stripe so, on the serato. Yeah, for super lunars. Yeah, definitely for lunars. Okay. And then I think I think just for visual as well because it had the stripes all over. So, but but for for your business side, just so everybody listening doesn't get the wrong idea. Yeah. He doesn't change out the cups. We don't do that. I, see, just I didn't want to answer it, but I didn't want to say no. You know what I mean? Just like not answer your question. Um, yeah. <laughs> why, why wouldn't you do it? Or, or have you considered doing it? Definitely. You know, we, maybe we can dive into this a bit later. Yeah, but, no, that, but... that helps actually. We can get a little more into it and explain why. But um, <clears throat> so it just kind of, for one, it's pretty time consuming. Uh, a lot of shapes mm -hmm. or some shapes more than others are very difficult actually to get the, the cups off the sword. Uh, so it can be a pain to do that. And then also, I don't know. Yeah. It just takes a lot of time because it's already time consuming enough to weigh each Ken and Tama and um, have to mix and match them. So it would, I mean, maybe if people were willing to pay, I don't know though. I'm just not personally interested. I don't think there's much of a demand for it. Like I rarely get asked that question and I, I don't want to promote it. Like, uh, as much as like I do like to offer the customizations, like I also don't want to encourage people to get like too uh, I don't know heady or about like what equipment they're using. It focus more on like the play and like having fun yeah. with it, you know? Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, I'll have lots of questions on that that I want to dive into because I think there's a a unique you know place that you've landed there, and there's a lot to dive in on that. So let, let's hit a couple more questions, and then we'll jump back into that conversation. But I I want to come back to that because I think that's that's the money spot. All right, um, we got a question here from james.ken underscore Dama, James Dama. Oh, this is definitely going to be an episode worth watching, he says. Uh, I guess I could drop a question here. What happens with a lot of the spare parts that come on full setups? I see a lot of people mash up serial elevate Kens or one-ups with Rhino Clear uh, Israel Thomas. So there should be a decent amount of Israel Kanama uh, and Soul serial Thomas laying around, right? He's just wondering what happens to the excess. So uh, I've been trying to not like, I have a lot of excess right now that I don't know what to do with. I'm thinking about doing like mystery boxes. Um, I did recently have somebody hit me up that like wanted to uh, give some kendamas to a school. So they were like just buying them off of soup for really cheap. Um, I'd be open to anything like that. But for the most part, uh, not every time everything come. we're not buying everything as a complete sometimes for example soul sells can only and sometimes we'll get can only so there won't be any like spare parts for that and we're trying to do that and like not have too much excess you know that, that people don't mm -hmm. want or need mm -hmm. you you said we a couple times is this a multiple person operation or is it just you right now i just say we i don't like to say Dude, I don't it's know. the I royal don't... we i get it i do it all yeah the is time. that a thing it's okay like, good yeah 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 it's I mean, like I... <laughs> I say it all the time for Kavik and Nama. Yeah, we out here doing this. You know, we're working really hard to get this. And like, it removes me from it. So it feels like right. it's a bigger thing. <laughs> I say it all the time. Yeah. Um, but I have actually recently been getting help from uh, the, one of those original homies, which is a super cool thing, how it all came back together. Uh, like the first, one of the first two people that I met through Kendama in Connecticut. Uh, he's been getting super involved behind the scenes and also I've been getting a hand from Chris Papa a good bit as well. Um, mm. But but for it's like mostly mostly me. Um, yeah. and, it, and this was only like a development within the past like month or two. Um, the whole year prior, it was like completely independent. Yeah, cool. Okay, uh, I like that. Let's hit one one more question here. Let's hit a couple from the chat and then we'll jump back into it because I think we the, the people want to know about the depot. And I want to okay, know about yeah, the depot and the yeah. community building and the events that you've been running recently. Okay, uh, question here from Matt underscore Medeiros. Medeiros. Medeiros, 17. Yeah. Thank you for the help there. 
Uh, sure. He wants to know, uh, out of every Frank and Dama, what has been your favorite setup that you've made? It's Man. a tough question for the guy who's doctored so many Kandamas. I, I literally have spent like a good few minutes in separate occasions as well, thinking about this, trying to prepare an answer and still haven't. I can't do favorites like that. Um, I, w I wish that it was more nuanced, like like four lunars or like what, which one did you feel like you leveled up the heart? I don't know. Something like that. But cause I don't know. I've had a lot of, there's a lot of damas that I just play that I like, they're decent, but like, I don't totally vibe with. And then there's a lot of damas that I play that like, I really vibe with that dama and I leveled up hard on it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, so, but I have a few of those and some of them aren't even mashups, you know? So it's not, again, like I'm not super anal about, uh, mm -hmm. picking, picking a specific dama I, I i'm more in it just to experiment and try different stuff and like to get the perfect dama every time mm -hmm. cool yeah there and that that's the hard question right is like when when you literally play with so many kandamas and you're putting them together it's like they're like the same question is like what's the best setup for who for mm -hmm. who who is it for mm -hmm. that's that's the real question is is it might be the best setup for someone but it may not be the best setup for you and so you may you may have your personal favorite that you've made that you would want to play but someone else might have a favorite setup that you've built for them. So hard question to answer. Yeah, it is. But it is. I've seen this scrolling through the chat nonstop this morning uh, from a lot of people. Beast Coast. Beast what Coast. is Beast Coast? Beast Coast is the East Coast. Um, and it's a family. It's a family. It's a family. Who is the Beast Coast? I want to know. I've seen it from like 12 people in the chat already. So I need, I need some answers. <laughs> Well, we never really used that as like an official term, right? So for example, Ken YC was like an official uh, group within uh, New York and like New Jersey area. Um, I have, a, I had a page for like Connecticut Kendama, uh, but Beast Coast is just like a, you know, a thing where it's like, if you know, you know, um, and just people that have come together through Kendama on the East Coast, like we're all of a family. I don't know. I think that like, that's pretty true. Uh, in most communities across the world, but there's something special. I, I don't know. I think there's something different about the East Coast and how all these different groups have come together in a very like non-competitive and uh, inclusive space. And Beast Coast, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a family. Where does where does the Beast Coast range? Is it New York down to Florida, or where 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 would be the the Beast Coast? You know, if you if you had to map it out, what is the Beast Coast? Um. Yeah, we, we that's a that's a tricky thing about using like claiming the East Coast, right? Because uh, we that group that I'm referring to when we say Beast Coast is like Northeast, uh, I would say maybe as far as like New Jersey for the most part. I'm sure that, like, but again, it's not like a fine line, right? Um, and it's just like people who have there, there's a there's a core group of people that have been super committed to Kendama in the community within like the Northeast range. And then of course, anybody that comes up or, or visits or whatever, like you're, you're, you know, it's not like we treat you like some outsider, but uh, yeah, sorry. I don't know. Did that that kind of answered your question, right? Yeah, totally. I, I think it does. And, and that's the thing. I love that kind of stuff, man. Every, every community seems to, you know, create this name for themselves, you know, wherever you go, you got, well, I don't know. I feel like Florida has a name for their own community there that I, I'm just forgetting right now. Uh, mm. But wherever you go, it's like you got the Spokane crew, the Washington crew, you know, everybody's got their little region that seems to have collected, you know, players and built up this scene. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk more into how that built uh, there. But let, let's hit a couple more questions there. Austin Donovan, shout out to Austin Donovan. You've literally filled the questions here with <laughs> in, incredible questions. I want to hit there as many as I can. But let me jump wow. to a couple people's before we jump into Austin's questions, because he has some really, really good ones. And, and obviously, I think, you know, Austin fairly well, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you guys live. I don't know how far you're in Connecticut. How far are you from New York? Um, I'm like two and a half hours from the city. Uh, Austin is in Long Island. So I think, but I think I was talking about only like three hours from him. Um, so not even far. Yeah, not very far. But we've done it. We've definitely hung out a good few times. Cool. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, answer a question here. So this actually will lead us into into the further further conversation about Kanama Depot from Kanama Cares. Ooh, uh, is there a specific Kanama that feels too sacrilegious to dismember and piecemeal? Do you have uh -huh. one Kanama that you're like, I, I could I could never sell this as two <laughs> different pieces. <laughs> I'm sure they exist, uh, like just more historical pieces. For example, something that came to mind was like the uh, Sweets Mugen collab. Um, mm. The Depot probably would do it, but 
I, I can understand like that thought process. The Depot would do it. Sure. But, yeah, but like no, MJR wouldn't, no, wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> Straight up, no, for real. Like I wouldn't, but the Depot probably would. Um, but I, I haven't had any of those damas that I feel that way about uh, at the Depot. Uh, those stuff, those types of damas are usually not gonna, you know. Or for example, like something hand turned, you know, say like a tear, something something that Rod made uh, that was just like made to go together, you know. <clears throat> but those wouldn't, wouldn't be things that I would carry at the Depot, anyways. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, CVN.ng wants to know, is the depot enough for a career or just a side hustle? And is there a future plan to make it one? Where, where are you at now? You're graduated high school. Uh, we didn't really get into this, but I think this is a good spot to, to jump into that. What are you doing now? You're obviously running Kanama Depot, but is that your full-time gig? Is that full-time? No, no, it's not. Um, I do have a part-time job that I'm kind of just floating by on. And, but I think, I don't know, I see potential for it to be, be a lot bigger than it is so um i've been definitely treating it as a side hustle and not taking it very seriously but within like the past few months especially i'm starting to shift my mindset and want to turn it into like a legit business uh so we are working on a website i think that's going to be a crucial part of that next step um so stay tuned for that stay tuned for the website I, what what do you see as kind of the future for Kanama Depot in terms of it being your your full time hustle? Do you see that as like a one year path, two year path? You know, where, it's hard to where say. It's really hard to say. It depends how fast I move. Um, and because I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to starting a business, mm -hmm. uh, I know there's a lot that goes into it. So it's hard for me to predict. You know, and I also just don't like to put that type of time restriction or like pressure on myself uh, for something like that so, uh, so i don't really have a time frame in mind i just know that like i've been having a good time um so i'm going to keep going and, unless that you know with, without question unless that changes <clears throat> yeah well let's ask one more question and then i actually let's let's dive really deep into that there uh with there's so many questions every week i'm like oh i want to hit as many of these as we possibly can but there's so many good ones it's so hard uh, uh, so uh let me ask one question here Austin Donovan has so many good ones in here. So let me, <laughs> let me give you one from him now. And we'll probably hit through a lot of his questions because a lot of them are about the, the development of Kanama Depot. Uh, Austin Donovan mm -hmm. wants to know, or he rather states, uh, give us a taste of super add-on. Wow, what is wow, super add -on? savage, savage. Um, so people, I think uh, we haven't really clearly defined all different games in Sorry, my bad. We're good. We're good. Um, so, oh, maybe he's getting a call. There we go. We're having some technical difficulties today. Hang tight, folks. I I can't hear you right now, um, MJ. Do you want to leave and then jump back in? There we go. You're good. You know. Perfect. Oh, okay. Cool. Sweet. That was weird. Um. I've lost you again. We're having some. <laughs> yeah, my music keeps start playing. It's starting playing randomly. I'm not touching the little thing. Someone's sneaking into your your. It's uh, like your Spotify. Something's trying to tell me not to talk about add-on or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I was saying that a lot of people confuse. Like we haven't clearly defined all the different games in Kendama, and a lot of people confuse add-on with one-up, which are very similar. Um, <clears throat> oh wow, you're right, Austin. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, add-on, super add-on is basically just a variant of add-on where we include superpowers. It's kind of hard to explain with just words, uh, at least right now. And honestly, I'd rather wait until I can explain it better because I am uh, working on creating like a, comp a competition format with add-on, which Ooh. I'm kind of keeping on the low-key, you know what I mean, until we figure it out. Uh, but, well, I guess not so low-key, but... <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, that. I, I did a live a while back. Uh, I don't remember who I was chatting with, but we were talking about different styles of competitions and doing a, a bracket based competition with add on uh, mm -hmm. or, or something like that, where, you know, it was two pros going head to head in the game of add on yes, rather dude. than, yes. rather than uh, like just an open division style thing. It was like, cause Hey, there's a bit of silliness to it and watching them like both do like a Ken flip to, you know, penguin base cup or something. And it's like, you know, it's just like you, you keep them going on it. And it's like, you keep making it harder. I, I think there'd be a lot of fun 
own casting to do with that, like as a as a host of that. I think yeah. it'd be so fun. And we're we're messing around with the the rules of add on and adding some some more spice to it. We'll say because uh, yeah, there's some room to some room to play with. So it's gonna. I'm super excited to share it with everybody because um, everybody that I've shared it with in person. Uh, this is something that me, Grove, Austin, and Shane uh, Donahue all came up with last year on the key, uh, the Kanam Institute tour together. And then this throughout this year, whenever I have been able to get um, around other Donald players, I've been experimenting more with different rules and different variants and different game modes, you could say. So, and I've been getting a lot of positive feedback. So um, I'm really excited to like organize it and put it together and hopefully like share it publicly, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cool. I like it. I like it. So guys, stay tuned. Follow MJR. Make sure that you are up to date Ooh. on the new stuff coming out. Okay, yeah. so uh, MJR, let, let's dive into Kanama Depot. Uh, and actually, let's catch up to where Kanama Depot is. How did Kanama Depot start? Uh, so we, we left mm. off kind of before the Q&A with you were doing this hustle, you were with Lunatac, and then you, you left Lunatac, or what did that separation look like? Catch us up from there to Kanama Depot. Yeah, I honestly can't say that I left Lunatac. I think Lunatac kind of left us. Um, yeah, I can't remember like me having a reason to say I was leaving. I don't know, maybe because at some point after Lunatac, um, I ended up getting an offer to be on Sweet's ambassador team um, and potentially kind of like open that door to start working with Kendama Institute more, which was like something I was super, super uh excited about like i was trying to get a, a hold of grow for so long um <laughs> that's a tough <laughs> I, task to do <laughs> i don't know if he's like how many other people experienced that but um oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and so yeah then sweets put me on the ambassador team um and then that was kind of really where the whole idea for the depot started um I guess somebody, uh, it was actually Tyler at, I don't know if you remember Kendama MPLS. Tyler mm -hmm. uh, shared, I guess, with Gabe, the CEO at Suites, uh, just like what I was doing and that I could potentially work with them, right, for getting Domo's wholesale um, or just like as an ambassador for Suites. And so <clears throat> when I was, when I started getting Suites Domo's wholesale, uh, it kind of just happened naturally word of mouth. Like the, the deep, I wasn't, at this point, I think this was like 2019. I wasn't like, Hey, I want to start a Kendama shop or like, you know, start this business. But, um, once I started getting cushion Damas in, then I would get like random people hitting me up because cushion such a highly desired paint and sometimes mm -hmm. very limited and sells out. Right. So if I have a product that somebody really wants, um, they would just hit me up and somebody that I don't know across the country. Right. Uh, and then when they would get it, if they were happy, especially if I was like doing the extra stuff, like weighing it or whatever, they would be super stoked and they would go tell their friends. And then, now there's two other people that hit me up, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. it kind of just like naturally started to grow through word of mouth of like, hey, hit this guy up, like for whatever you might need that he has, you know? Yeah, so you never set out to start this. You just were yeah. doing, it kind of happened as an accident more than anything. That, it kind of came to me, to just like happen. Kendama. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, and, and it's been fun so far. But yeah, same thing with Kendama. Like I wasn't really looking for the depot, um, but it just kind of made sense. And uh, I've always wanted to do my own thing uh not necessarily just within kendama but just like i've always wanted to have my own business and uh, be I, I i had conflict with like the idea of being uh, directly representing one brand in kendama because my roots are like very independent you know and i i don't know i i don't want to like be just attached to one company you know yeah, well, why did you feel the need to start a, a, a business? You, you've said that a couple times, I think, and, and this desire to do entrepreneurship. Where does that come from for you? I don't, I don't know. I've always been like an independent thinker, you could say. And um, it just seems more fun to me. Like when it comes to money, if I have to make, if I have to make a certain amount of money, which important, you know, I do. If I didn't have to, that would be awesome. But we do. So it's either going to be through a job typically where somebody's telling you how much you're, you know, you, you get paid uh, when you have to show up, um, et cetera. And I think that like the idea of having your own business, the, to me, the, the, the appeal is like having more control over your life and um, the ability, like, yeah. So, you know, that, and also like a scalable source of income that that's just more exciting to me. You know what I mean? Like, no, I look at it kind of like, like business. I look at kind of like a game, 
uh, and something that you can sesh and like learn new skills and level up on. Whereas a job doesn't always feel like that. At least a lot of my jobs in the past didn't. So it just seems like a more fun way to live. I mean, obviously it's not necessarily easier, uh, but in certain ways, but I'm more motivated to do that naturally. And I'm not very mo like, I'll just slide by like in school. I didn't want if, if I'm not into it, uh, if a job or school, then I won't really push myself within it. So right. it just, yeah, I have to follow what, like my, what I really want, you know, dude, that that's the hustle and you got to respect that. You got to respect the hustle. I love it. Okay. So, <laughs> so you, you ended up getting all these people DMing you, asking them for custom setups. Uh, when did it actually become Kendama Depot and what brands do you work with today? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that was going on for probably at least like half a year before the whole idea or the whole name Kendama Depot, because like I said, when I first got on with sweets, um, then I wasn't thinking of starting a business at that point. It kind of just came as that natural word of mouth developed. And then there was probably like a good few months where I was like, you know, like maybe this could be a legit business, but I don't know what I would call it. And it took me a while to find the name. Honestly, I remember like talking to multiple people about it. Like, I just don't know. I feel like I need to have the right name. You know, I can't just put like some name that I don't feel really makes sense or whatever. Um, sorry. I know that I, there was, I think there was two questions I was answering. One was where'd the name come from? Yeah. Like uh, when, when did it become Kendama Depot? And then the second question was, and what brands do you work with now? Um, <clears throat> yeah. I don't keep track of all these things. I know we work it's, with it's sweet. that many. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I mean, I know we work with sweets, Kusa, Chrome, we have okay. with Soul, uh, Quill, Analog, um, Kendama Israel, uh, talking with Da Origins. Da Origins, hit me up. No, um, but yeah, I don't know. There's probably a few more that I'm not thinking of. Lotus, um, but really whoever is down and whoever has product that people are hyped on, which is most companies. Um, yeah, so do you, do you just shoot DMs at these companies being like, yeah, <laughs> I'd love to do some wholesale and get some products. And do you tell them what you're doing and doing mixing, mashing, like, or do they care? What, what does that look like? Because if so, I was a company owner, you know, I might be like, oh, you're going to put my Ken with another company's Tama. You know, that, that, so, that maybe seems conflicting. So it worked out really well that uh, I was involved with the community before. Because, yeah, I, I, I had that concern as well. But... I had already built a rapport with a lot of these companies through like getting prizes for just like hosting events, say a few years ago, uh, or at least for like saying sweets, Kusa, Chrome, and just like for being around for so long, like I already had rapport with some of these different business owners and whatnot. Um, and I don't think that I always ad like advertise it as like, Hey, like I'm going to put your stuff on somebody else's thing. Um, it just, mm -hmm. it was just like, Hey, like, Whole, you, if you give me Damas wholesale, like then the rest is on me. You know what I mean? So, right. um, and I haven't had any pushback though. I think that so far everybody's, yeah, everybody's been cool with it. Um, I think that it's just an objective want from the market. And it's something that I think was inevitable bound to happen eventually anyways. Um, why not work with, you know, work with me instead of like work against me. Cause people, if people like it, people want it, then like it would benefit the companies for them to be a part of that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, and you found a really cool spot there, right? No, I don't really think there's anyone else doing that from from my knowledge. I know that some of the, like, so I, I don't do this, but I know that some of the distributors for specific brands will sometimes mix and match that brand's Thomas and Ken's to make custom setups. But I think you're pretty much the only one, aside from maybe a small other handful of, of other wholesalers from multiple brands, that's actually doing custom setups where you're taking brands, Thomas and Ken's and mixing and matching. Yeah, as far as I know, as far as I know. Yeah, okay, which so is crazy walk, to me, but yeah, w walk me through right now what it looks like for me as a customer to order through you, because uh, I think a lot of people don't know uh, what that actually looks like. I I don't know to be honest. I haven't ordered. Yeah, I need to make sure. an order sometime. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, for sure, and it's a super unorthodox way of doing business. Again, it kind of it, it started with people just messaging me, uh, and that's still what it is to this day. It was really all word of mouth and. Um, so yeah, what it looks like is somebody tells you about the depot and they're like, yo, go hit him up, go, go talk to him, message him. And, um, yeah, just like, basically you just message me and let me know what, what you want. Uh, and we'll figure out all the details from there in terms of like pricing. If you're looking for certain weights, whatever it is, um, whatever questions you might have, we would, an I would answer there. Um, but yeah, it's all going down through the DMS. It goes down in the DMS. 
Cool. And so, so now I, I know you were saying earlier that you're trying to build a website. Is that because you're finding it to be too stressful working in DMs now? <laughs> Just like you're losing track of things. I feel that man. Dude. When I started doing uh, distribution for soul up here in Canada, like I started uh -huh. it with DMs. It's like, Oh man, on like a launch day, it's like, it's hard to keep up with everybody's DMs and like send them their tracking info and all of it. It's exhausting. So I finally Bro. set up the website to do it. Yeah, it has definitely been a grind. Um, but there's something really cool about it, which is that now we get to talk. I get to talk to each of these people, uh, not only as like through, you know, right. selling them something, but I get to like build a relationship with tons of different people and talk to them about other things besides just the Dama they want. Um, and that's like the more like, I'm kind of torn about like the depot being my, my image or like what I'm known for, because it's like distributing the toys. is like not the passion, right? The passion is the people. Yeah. And, uh, but that's, but that's been the balance in how it's like worked um, is that I get to like talk to people and stuff. So dude, Oh man, that that's the good stuff. <laughs> now you're making me all sappy. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I I'm taking down the website. We're going back to the DMS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean it is chaotic bro it's it's um but we've, we've like i've kind of developed a system um and i'm just fortunate that i've had the time and the ability to focus on it because it yeah it takes a lot of time so no don't yeah. no shame and not wanting to deal with it I, I don't want like it's a little too much sometimes so oh man you. guys hit that heart button for michael <laughs> man the guy the guy puts on the guy loves you guys show no, him I some do. love back yeah like, they do Dude, Michael, that's so cool. Honestly, you are a very appreciated person in the community. I know someone else said it in the chat here this morning. You know, the Dama fam loves you in particular as well. Uh, that, if, for Homies. those of you that don't know, the Dama fam is a Facebook group on, on Facebook uh, dedicated to the Kanama community. And, and I think you are probably one of the, the shining members on there in some regards. Like, you're on there pretty <laughs> actively. And the guys all, literally, it's like, you know, anyone's like talking about brands or getting Kanamas and like, go to the Kanama Depot, go to the Kanama Dude, Depot, go straight to the Kanama up, Depot. It's, it's wild so cool. because, I mean, I really haven't done much of any self-promotion for the Depot. It's been all other people spreading the word uh, organically, which it obviously feels so good, you know, and like, um, I, yeah. pre like I, I feel like everybody else has built the Depot more than I have uh, sometimes. And I have so many people that I like. I feel like I owe you guys, you know? Um, but yeah, lots of good homies. What do you think? Okay, so may maybe this is a hard question for you to answer, but why do you think you were so loved by the community from what you're doing? What did you do right? What did you do that we all need to pick up on to, <laughs> to have that same kind of community around us? <clears throat> I don't know. I guess like maybe put other people first if, I don't know. Um, like I want to give more than i take uh i think that that's mm. like the foundation of a, a lot of things in my life so, so i I don't, I don't know though i mean this is i don't know like i'm sure there's a lot of things that go into it i guess is uh so i don't have a simple answer I and mean, I, I could maybe this maybe that yeah but, but you have to ask think, them they could tell you yeah that. yeah but down in the chat tell us what you love about michael we, we want to know oh well, let's that's let's, let's, much let's elevate this let's guy's ego <laughs> just a little bit today because he's already too <laughs> humble a uh, very genuine, very humble guy. Uh, Michael, the people love you, man. You you put on for Konami. You've built community around you. It's actually so insane uh, how much support that you have in this community that is, you know, it's growing and broad, but yet you've maintained this posture as someone who pours into the community more than you ever take from it. And you do that in more than just the depot. You do that by hosting events. You do that by building your local community. Uh, and you also do that through Kente Sensei uh, training as well and testing. Uh, talk to me about some of those other avenues that you work in. You know, what does it mean to build events? What does it mean to build your mm. community? And and how does Kente Sensei involve mm. in that? Wow. Um, so community building has really like been my my deepest passion within Kendama um, the whole time, or at least like since 2014. Um, and yeah, we talked a little bit about the whole story. Events are so fun, man. There's just nothing better. And I think that as we're moving into I, you were saying like i think we're moving into like that third stage of kendama's development where mm -hmm. now it's like most a lot of people know what kendama is right um so events don't have the same feeling as they did say two or three years ago when you know that like 80 percent of the people at this event 
are meeting, like they don't know 80% of the people at these events. They haven't even seen them online uh, they, or, or they don't have anybody that they play with. Right. Like that person that's been like, cause we were at the time, most people that played Kendama didn't have a squad or like a lot of people didn't have a squad. Uh, so it meant so much for them to be able to go and meet and hang out with other like like-minded people and Kendama players. Um, so that is like the coolest thing. Um, and that's like why events are probably my, my deepest uh, passion just bring people together um you, yeah. you you threw a few questions at me yeah, yeah. so we, we can jump to the other ones but what events do you run and and what does it look like to build those <clears throat> so the only one that i can say is like a, a, an annual or would have been an annual recurring event is uh nekc which is the new england or was the new england kendama classic um i hosted a ton of like very you know just like huck it uh events back in i don't know maybe like 2016 to 18 um that aren't like annual ones that were just like hey guys like let's get together and play kendama but that's one that we would like to be annual it kind of got messed up with covid um and i want to start something with an add-on format competition and maybe some other ideas as well uh but the depot is kind of getting in the way of that with in terms of just like focus but hopefully once i can get the the back end of the depot and like the shop end um kind of like operating and like going on it you know relatively on its own then i can focus more back on events um, yeah i feel that dude that that feels like you're pre you're preaching to the choir here man i'm like i'm trying to do all of these different things like i just need <laughs> to get one thing right before i even start doing the other thing and just make sure this one's running smoothly and then we can begin working on this i'm the worst dude. for trying to do too many things and burning out <laughs> <laughs> well dude you are absolutely crushing it like bro I've thought about a podcast so many times and like yours is definitely the closest to uh, what I would want it to look like, you know, <laughs> and just, I feel like you just do like such a service to the community with this. Um, seriously. Like it, it's, yeah, it's my favorite, definitely my favorite <laughs> Donald podcast. Uh, well, well, thank you. There are some really, really good podcasts out there. And, and honestly, I, similar story, like it all started by accident. It mm. just started as me jumping on a live talking about brewing coffee uh, Word. And people are like, you should just do this again and get a guest yes. on and get another guest on. I was like, okay, I'll, I guess I'll keep doing this every week. And next thing I know, I have a podcast that's like eight episodes deep. And I was like, how did this even begin? And now it's now we've been running for rocking for what thirty eight episodes or something like that. We're Dude. pretty deep. We're over halfway through a year now. It's crazy. That's so awesome. But yeah, seriously, like you're doing a great job with it. Um, and uh, and also your event uh brew battle <laughs> looked super sick bro like i was like damn that's how you run an event uh, that's what i was thinking when i saw it was it. so fun it, w it was really a blast we're, we're gonna run it again this year that's the plan assuming everything everything can function and if the borders open up we'd love to have our mm. american friends to come so Dude, I, would, I would love to i would love to be there yeah okay so uh talk to me then a little bit about uh you know uh, kendama sensei and and how mm. you got involved there let's talk a little bit about kendama institute and then let's hit through some questions and, and put a nice bow on this episode i've learned a lot man dude a lot about how to be loved by the community just pour in first put put value mm. in you will receive value back if you ask for value you're not gonna mm. get it don't ask don't ask um yeah so kendama institute came uh it's around the same time sweets ambassador so some i don't know i want to say like 2019 i really don't like put times uh, very well but um <clears throat> and then sensei stuff came through that um i remember it was nick nako 2020 wait no 19 2019 um where they did the first sensei training live at nako uh with some people from Glocan, um, and I just like heard about the. There was a few different. What do they call them? Uh, those little things where you go into the room and you do the. Oh, the breakout rooms. No, uh, um, it was at Nako, in person. Oh man, I can't yeah, believe I can't. They remember were doing the all name. the like uh, training sessions and stuff like that. Yeah, in, yeah, in all side. those different little uh, sessions. There were some cool ones. I didn't get to yeah, tune into much, yeah. but uh, I remember uh, Tio and Reed Stark did one on like the the street culture of kendama or something like seminars yeah uh Seminar, austin yeah, yeah. dropped the dropped the word there um but yeah that w so i i just heard about it and i was interested in some of the other kendama institute peeps uh were like yo come through check it out um so yeah that was where we got trained to be able to um 
I guess, do the, the testing. Um, <clears throat> but I'm skipping over some stuff with Kendama Institute before then, I think. Or was it after? Man, time. Funny thing. <clears throat> so, um, sorry. Yeah, I'm like losing my, my train of thought. Because like, okay. I know you asked yeah. a couple of questions. Yeah. When, when did you become a sensei? What was that like? Yeah, that was 2019 in, uh, at NACO. Mako, yeah. and then I don't even know when, how much. I guess it was we were spreading it like personally before um, COVID hit, but then I think it really picked up more when we went online with it, and we were doing uh, the mm -hmm. weekly online sessions, and then when it started to become a requirement for competitions as well, it picked up some momentum, and uh, that was lots of fun, uh, lots of good learning experiences there, and just like helping people, you know figure out their path in Kendama. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's, let's do a little exercise here for a second. I'm, I'm curious, what, what does a Kendama sensei do? If I was a brand new player, you know, I, I just kind of picked up Kendama. Uh, do you want to do a test? Yeah. Did yeah. I, did I, did I jump the gun with that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, but so walk, walk me through like, what is the role of a Kendama sensei or a Kente sensei? Uh, what do they do? And, and how do I, you know, how do I reach out? Walk me through, walk me through the relationship process there. So senseis are just people that are trained to uh, host the Kente test um, and get that approved by Gloken. Um, so it hasn't, like, like I said, there was a point where we were doing it online, like weekly, and it had some momentum, uh, which has kind of died down. Um, but that was like the meat of it, really. Um, I, I think that honestly, the term sensei implies like it sounds a lot heavier than at least in my opinion, it, it really was. Uh, so I, cause I feel like that my answer wasn't that deep, you know, mm. but it was mainly just for the testing, you know, and that you were like somebody that could do the testing. Yeah, okay. So it, but is that is that the extent of what a sensei does? Or do you guys do like trainings or anything like that for for players as well beyond just doing the test? Because so I'm, I'm kind of leading the question because I've been in I've been in some of those rooms uh, as you know, someone just hanging out getting a test. But also I see the educational value in there. It's like more right. than just a test, right? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, within that space. Um, yeah, there's a lot of people just sharing ideas and sharing tips and you know mindset tips as well as like physical tips um but it's also a very collective like collaborative space as well it's not like it's all coming from the sensei right it's like mm -hmm. people are kind of just hanging out as well on the side while somebody's getting tested everybody else is just like hanging out chatting sharing ideas etc so it's a cool mm -hmm. it's a really cool space yeah it, it really is so those of you that haven't done it already i don't know if you guys are doing some testings in the in the short near future here soon but definitely go get tested first off a you'll learn a lot about just practicing and consistency b all of the senseis are incredibly great humans that want to see you grow and develop as more than just a kendama player but as a human who's learning to wrestle with not landing something and the frustrations of that you know i i watch some of these senseis walk through with a younger mm -hmm. younger person playing and mm -hmm. seeing them just get frustrated that they can't get to the next level. And, and the amount of encouragement and support and energy that they pour into seeing that kid or that, that adult, whoever it is, conquer that challenge that's in front of them is so rewarding in itself, right? Mm -hmm. To watch that, what, to watch another human beat something is so empowering to myself. And yeah, I no, it's, conquer, everybody I, wants, oh. yeah, everybody in, the, everybody in the space wants to see the person win and succeed you know uh, it's not a, like there's no competitive and i think it can be kind of intimidating like especially this i don't know just the sound of it if you don't know i'm sure there are like I, i've actually heard of some people that were like interested but like kind of just intimidated right because i didn't know but it's a really really wholesome space like everybody's there just to learn and level up dude it is and that's that's the thing i love about kendama it's like kendama is an individually collaborative sport right where we mm -hmm. can all play by ourselves but at the same time i don't think any of us do really play by ourselves we're playing in community and even when you go to events like sure it's a competition but more often than not i'm seeing the person going up against the other person cheering the other person on we we want to see yeah. them land the trick against us we don't yeah. want to see them miss the trick we would rather we'd rather go head to head toe to toe everybody hitting the tricks having a really nice competitive and encouraging match than to be like dude oh i really hope you missed this next trick come on miss it miss it yeah like, we don't yeah see that in Kendama, or at least very rarely and if we do that person usually doesn't stick around very long because they realize mm. that that kind of behavior or attitude just like doesn't mesh yeah it's not yeah it's not the and, move 
And I think a lot of that actually stems from individuals like yourself or like Kanama Institute by creating a culture where that doesn't exist, right? By focusing yeah. on a culture where we empower people to conquer their own personal challenges, not to try and defeat someone else's. Yeah, I mean, I think Kendama is almost like inherently a tool for that. But we've been super fortunate. Um, I remember, you know, maybe somewhere around 2014, just thinking into the future, like when Kendama does blow up, you know, like, who's going to be the person who brings the most people to Kendama? What kind of impression are they going to give it? And like, yeah. is the culture going to change? Because I'm comparing it to like skateboard culture at the time where like, and I show up to a skate park, like, not everybody there was making sure that I felt welcome, you know what I mean? Um, but Kendama has been pretty good about that in terms of like the more influential people uh pretty consistently are very inclusive and like make sure that it is a safe and healthy space which is awesome because like it's growing and it's impacting a lot mm -hmm. of people <clears throat> dude absolutely and you are at the forefront of that through kendama depot your sensei training the events that you run and the community that you've built around you um dude thank you for being here i want to hit through some of these questions that we left alone in the q a tool but let me first say a, a big thank you to, to jump in on the review i've learned a lot i definitely wanted to give you the platform to speak to the community a bit more uh, for the work that you're doing with the depot uh, to remind people about kente sensei and to encourage people to you know keep pressing in i think the biggest learning so far that i think people need to pick up on if i were to pull one thing out of this episode so far you know there's a lot but the one thing is if you want to receive value from Kendama and the community in particular, you need to be a value giving person first, right? Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned it really clearly in the principle of, I want to give more than I take, right? If you come into the room looking to add value to other people first, you're, you're in return gonna receive a lot of value, but you yeah. have to be willing to put yourself there first. Yeah, I mean, I guess I wouldn't know the difference and like, maybe that's up for debate, but I almost feel like, at least for me, that's more natural. And that's like almost the smarter strategy. Like if I walked in yeah. trying to take, I feel like I'm not going to, I wouldn't get as much, well, you know what I mean? People wouldn't give as much. I don't know. It's well, funny you, how I, well, you burn out too, right? Like if you walk into a room mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, let me just see what I can get from all these people. Sure. You might get something in the short term. You might like gain whatever it is you might, but, but you know, you're only going to last for, for such a short amount of time. You're going to burn out. You're going to make a lot of people frustrated because you're not adding value back into them. <laughs> you're just trying to get everything from them. Mm -hmm. and, and you're not going to stick around. And it's not going to feel like a welcoming community to you because you're not making it a welcoming community for yourself. So anyways, yeah. that, dude, that's, my, that's my little bit of wisdom uh, that, that I've pulled out of this episode from, from our conversation so far that I think people need to listen to. But let's hit some questions if you're ready. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. I know Austin Donovan's got so many in here. <laughs> Austin, I appreciate you so, so much. But uh, there's a couple fun ones in here. MP Page 88 wants to know, what international brand do you want to add to your inventory the most? Add? Well, I mean, oh man, it's like, dare I even say the name? Obviously, uh, there's a lot of hype around Sioux Lab products. Uh, if, you're, if you're on Facebook, I'm sure you've seen in the past couple of weeks, somebody talking about Sioux Lab products, um, which would be cool. But... <clears throat> dot origins is right up there um i'm looking forward to working with them a lot there's so many companies now that like when you just shoot it off the top like i, I don't even i, I sometimes there's i'm like so i don't many. even know yeah there's so much going on right now um oh, oh yeah. okandamas was i also was just speaking oh. with them recently and they seem like they're doing a lot of cool stuff that i did not know like they're kind of becoming like their own brand as well as uh like a, a distributor for other brands and they got a lot of cool projects so i'm looking looking forward to working with them as well Mm -hmm. yeah i like that there there's so many cool brands that are coming out uh, a mm. recent favorite of mine i know he's in the chat uh, or he was in the chat for a little bit earlier is uh jacob who runs uh new lace kanama uh, and i know that he's been doing some work with you as well as kind of using you to facilitate the sales of his product like he's not even selling it he's actually running it through you he's like if you want to buy these kanamas and designs that i've made you got to go to the depot that's a cool yeah, collab that's, you got there dude so so cool um it's been a lot of fun jacob like is relatively new to Kendama. So I was like a little like hesitant at first. Like, um, I don't even think he's been playing for a year, which is so crazy to me. You know, like if I see somebody get into Kendama and immediately is like, for example, what could be viewed as take trying to take, right. Um, I'm like, you know, it just throws up a red flag for me. But like, as soon as I t spoke with him directly, I was like, wow, like I was so like, yeah. you know, he's Did a really, really good, good dude. 
So yeah, he's so an good. awesome, awesome dude. And uh, he's been doing like really cool stuff with New Ace. Uh, put a lot of really, really cool people on the team. And it's just been fun to work with him uh, and get like another perspective. Because before that point, I was doing everything in the depot pretty much by myself. Uh, and I think it helps me to like be able to talk to somebody else about like things that I'm struggling with or ideas that I have. So he's been like a, a rock kind of for the depot as well. Mm-hmm. It's been a really good symbiotic relationship. Yeah, I lo- dude, love that guy so much. Go give him some love afterwards. For those of you listening, new Lace Kanama on Instagram. Uh, Austin Donovan asked a really unique question. <laughs> I don't, I don't really know uh, where where this comes in uh, from, but he wants to know how does journaling help you in Kanama? So under the precedent mm. that you journal to help you in Kanama. Interesting. Well, I think that I, so I think that he's referring to. Uh, I was super heavy into journaling when we were together for like two weeks uh, for the long for the kendama institute tour um which hasn't been as heavy like present uh, of a thing in my life recently but and, and i don't think i use it as much for directly for kendama as it really was for just like personal stuff but um writing down tricks i trick ideas it can be super helpful i don't find myself i was talking with a friend about this recently like if i write down a trick i don't know like when i go to play kendama at least the way i play like i don't want to like look at a, a, a trick on a book and then force myself to do that trick like i kind of want to feel out whatever mm-hmm. i'm feeling in that intuitively right at that moment so um i can't say that it's direct that i've used journaling directly for kendama but i've definitely used it for personal development which flows into kendama you know Mm -hmm. that's cool and and i think there's a lot of value that you can get out of journaling as well i don't journal and honestly it's one of those things that like every every wise person in my life tells me that i should be journaling Mm -hmm. because it will help me to Mm -hmm. de-stress to release the Mm -hmm. things that are like clouding my mind because you can just Mm -hmm. put them down and then leave them there and come back to them and it's like closing tabs on your browser right? yes yes. it allows you to focus in on the one thing that you need to be doing dude I, i that 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 like wisdom has been haunting me so much in the past three weeks since uh, doing the episode with Shonuf Chris. He brought up like, dude, I I don't play Kanama until I do my dishes, do all my other things, do everything else because I don't play clearly if I have other things clouding my oh, thoughts. Oh wow! And, and for that reason, huh? Yeah, he's like he doesn't get creative flow if he's thinking about the dishes he needs to be doing or he's wow. thinking about all that stuff. And it's like journaling actually is such a release for your mind to take some of those things, those tabs that are open in your brain and just like put them and dock them over here in a physical place so your brain doesn't have to hold on to it. It's such a good docking system, even yeah. just to come back to you. A hundred percent. And like that, it, yeah, I think that was just like super powerful for me, uh, especially at that time, like a year or so ago, um, I hadn't, I hadn't been into journaling at the time. So, um, I had a lot of stuff that needed to get docked. I had a lot of stuff that needed to get docked. And now I feel like I'm kind of on the other side of that. Obviously it's not like, you know, there's nothing that needs to be docked, but there's less of an overwhelm. So it was like a really uh, critical tool for me. uh, Like, I guess entering a new era or phase or chapter of my life. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm definitely an advocate. Definitely an advocate. Yeah. Especially if you're like struggling with mental health, you know, more so for that. Like if you're doing good and like you feel good every day, like obviously you don't need it. But if you're struggling and you're not feeling good, like it could be really helpful. So, yeah. yeah. And well, it's also preventative, right? It's like it's also like a tool not just to get yourself to a good place, but to also keep yourself in that state of wellness where you're just doing better. I say this all out of like hypocrisy because I don't do it. Uh, I know. it's (laughs) No, but you're spot on. But uh, yeah, man, uh, the amount of healthy decisions I need to start making in my life. <laughs> Super <Yeah>. overwhelming. <laughs> um, okay, really, okay. I love this question from Doc Dama uh, because it really cuts through some of the noise, I think, often to be asked this question. You know, Doc Dama, uh, he, he wants to know, uh, he says, everyone's asking about Kanama Depot, but I want to know, how are you, MJ? Dude, that is so kind. Um, yeah. Thank you for asking. No, I'm actually doing very well um, this year. And honestly, like mainly through focusing on the depot has like helped me a lot uh, with my mental health, which was like definitely more of a problem. Um, and I've made some like significant progress with that, which is like the most important thing to me. And I think most people in life is like, how do you feel every day? You know what I mean? Like you want to feel good in life. Like that's so important. It doesn't matter what things you have, but if you're, if you have all these things and you're not feeling good inside, like that's going to weigh, I don't know, to me that matters more. So, um, I through through this past year and through the work that I've had to do on myself to do the depot. Um, 
I'm in like a much better place, I think, than I was even just a year ago. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Doc. Much love. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, is Kendama some, so for me, uh, a little insight into my world here, we're enter into vulnerability zone for a second. Kendama for me, I play way better when I'm in a healthy place and Kendama actually is the, one of the first things I'll put down if I'm not doing well. Uh, it's one of the things that I like get frustrated with. It can really frustrate me because I'm not doing well with it. Uh, and, and then I just kind of close off and I'll like my, like my coping is like going to video games and doing that. Uh, I know other people they're, they're coping when they're stressed or just overwhelmed. They'll go to Kendama. I'm, I'm curious mm. what your relationship with Kendama is when it comes to mental health and anxiety or stress or anything like that. Yeah, honestly, I'm more like you. Um, I can't say that Kendama, like I've been playing Kendama for like eight years or something and it definitely wasn't like the thing that made me overcome a lot of you know that that challenge in my life um it's brought a lot of positive experiences and like you know good things into my life for sure but i definitely if i'm not in a good place i'm not going to perform well it can, with my kendama and i'm not going to have the best time so it's not like something that i would go to if i'm feeling bad right um but it could definitely be preventative measure just, just on the merit of like exercise, you know, and like physically moving mm. your body. Um, so, it, you know, for me, it hasn't been like a directly like a mental health tool, uh, but it can, it, for many people it is. And indirectly, it definitely is. Yeah, it, it's been so interesting for me uh, because sometimes like Kanama is the thing that can keep me, like you were saying, it can like keep me pretty, pretty sane, but it can also be the thing that really frustrates me at times. And it can actually like, it can drive the nail into whatever thing that I'm feeling at the time, mm -hmm. because, you know, if I'm already overwhelmed with thinking about something and it's just like really beating me up and it's causing a lot of stress or mental health issues, uh, then playing Kendama and like not being able to focus and I'm missing like tricks that I know that I should be hitting actually yeah. hurts more right. uh, th yeah. than what I would want it to hurt. And it's like, I've been feeling that over the past several weeks. Like, you know, I mean, a lot of people have noticed I'm not posting much for tricks. But I've been I've been trying to just work on myself, right? I'm trying to focus right. on how do I how do I get back to a healthier place so I can actually come back to Kendama and play for fun, right? Enjoy mm -hmm. the art of flow. And and it's been so hard to get into that because I'm having a hard time doing the tricks that I, I could have done four years ago. Mm. Uh, because I'm so overwhelmed with everything in my life right now. Mm. And so it's so interesting to me the way that certain people approach things, because I know that there's a group of people in the community that would say the total opposite that they would come to Kendama to release those things. And that's right. not me. And yeah, it doesn't sound either. like that's you either. Well, that's the beauty, man. And I think that's so cool. And that's such a, like, a cool example of like how Kendama can be used in so many different ways. You know, you can find out how it works best for you in your life. Um, like I'm personally not even like in, within the whole world of Kendama, like my physical like skill level and ability within Kendama is like one of my lowest priorities. Like I don't really care to be that good. I care more about how, like, how much in, I'm enjoying the process. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so I don't know. I think it's really cool how it can work for different people in different ways. Yeah. Oh man, I, I love that kind of stuff, man. That's the good parts of, of conversations. Okay, let's maybe hit two more questions and then we're, we're, we're already past the hour and a half mark. Uh, there's already wow. so much content in here. It goes by so quick now. That's well, awesome. We, we used to do this show in less than an hour every week and because we had a time limit on IG Lives, but they, they bumped that up. Uh, here's actually a good question uh, from Julian Nad or AD. Julian AD underscore. Uh, he wants to know, a uh, Kendama Depot related question. How are you able to keep your prices so reasonable? Um, <clears throat> there is a... Well, I guess that's only the minimum, but wholesalers are pretty much expected to sell definitely not under uh, what the original brand would sell their product at retail. Um, and I don't know, I, I just think in terms of like, if I was a consumer, like I wouldn't want to pay much more than like retail for things. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, because we're well, so but to answer his question is more so because we're buying them at a wholesale rate, we're not we're not paying the retail price for them, uh, mm -hmm. as any other like retail reseller, or, like retailer wouldn't be. Yeah, it, it's a business, right? Like, and some people I think like it is a business, but we do it out of the, the goodness of our like, I, I started doing sole distribution in Canada, because I saw a need to help get lower, lower shipping prices for Canadians. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, like, I still make some profit on it, but, you know, not as much as what I, what I probably could be doing if I charge the price more. But it's like, we still have to make 
profitability in order to be able to do the things we're doing, right? So getting mm -hmm. them at a wholesale price is the only way to make it work. <laughs> right. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I know sometimes people don't realize that. And I'm like, what, these people think that I'm just doing this, like, just, you know what I mean? Like, with, for fun. Um, <laughs> but it yeah. is fun, but you can only do fun and lose money for so long. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. Uh, last question I want to ask, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. There's so many questions left over. I want to remind you guys, if you do want your questions asked and, and you feel like they're getting missed, uh, two ways that you can solve that problem. One way you can subscribe to the Patreon and get priority questions that do get mm -hmm. asked always. Mm -hmm. And number two, you can also put them on the post ahead of time because I actually add those into my show notes. So I actually mm -hmm. work through them. Uh, and then, uh, and then lastly, Three. you can still show up and put them in the question box, uh, but I will miss some of them. I uh, almost guaranteed every week. So let, let or, me ask him. Oh, four. You just hit me up. Like, just, yeah. I, I don't know. Like, yeah, just ask me the question, whatever it is. Like my DM. Yeah, we have DMs. <laughs> yeah, go drop MJ a question. DMs are open. You heard it here first. Uh, he didn't hear him here first. <laughs> He's been saying this for forever. Okay. Julian wants to know, or we, we asked this question. Last question I wanted to ask was, uh, actually, I'm going to ask two questions. There's one, one question here that seems to have some, some backstory to it. And I want to know, uh, mm -hmm. and then, and then lastly, I'll ask my question. Uh, MP page 88 wants to know question. Uh, was it Insta or flow? What is that? <laughs> so What's the context here? Honestly, bro, I don't know. I don't know either, but I do know that like, I, it's probably me calling out Dill. Dill's a really good friend of mine and I love to give him a hard time because he gives everyone a hard time. But anyways, it was probably something with me uh, challenging Dill on whether his trick was Insta or Flow uh, because there isn't like a, a clearly defined science for like what is an Insta and then what is just like a Flow Insta, right? Like, um, oh. so I'm, I'm sure he was poking fun. I'm, I'm thinking that's what he was talking about. Right. It's like when people do like their uh, Insta stunt playing fast hands, it's like some people like really cushion. Is that, is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. I, I love the cushion ones. They look really smooth and flowy. Like the yeah, Instas are totally. really flat, quick and flashy, but with the controlled like pressure up and then go back down, there's, there's a movement mm -hmm. to your body that looks so cool. I love it. Flow stuff. Anyway, yeah, flow stuff. Let's go. Austin Donovan. Yeah. Okay, the cool, last question I want to ask is, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've had to face uh, with Kanama Depot and building this business? <clears throat> um, my own... I guess like mental health, I don't know. That's pretty vague, but um, time management for sure. Uh, work ethic, like I was saying before, like I'm, I've always been the guy to do the least amount possible uh, in terms of like school or like work. Not, I guess that I shouldn't say that totally like for jobs, but anyways. Um, so I don't know a lot of personal stuff, you know, and just like my ability to like regulate and monitor my emotions um, and keep myself in a healthy headspace and keep myself focused on what I want to be focused on in life, you know, uh, focus, mm -hmm. I guess, is the other thing for sure. So yeah, I would say like mainly time management, organization stuff, um, emotional intelligence, and last one, the, the one that I said before, I already said it. So <laughs> yeah, dude, uh, that's all good stuff. And I think that's all stuff that I uh, I'm, I'm sure here, here's my theory. Here's my little theory of what this show is doing. I think from the review and from a lot of these conversations, I, I dream. Do you want to, this, this is my dream, Michael. All right. I dream I'm that listening. someone, that people, uh, li whoever's listening to this show feels inspired to actually go and do something. And I like asking these questions about how you build things so that the people that are listening to the show know how to start right? They know, they know what's going to, uh, you know, the tools that they need to begin doing things. You know, this episode in particular, we talked about some of the struggles and some of the accidental success and giving value in before you get value in return. Uh, last week's episode with Matt really dove into some of the hard journey of building a brand and like going week to week on paychecks. It's like, it, it's not as easy as people think it is. Uh, but mm. I hope that with this show and with the interviews with brand owners and people that have put in the work, put in the time, put in the energy, that there's going to be some people that rise up and say, you know what, I think I can do something. I think I can add value to the community in this unique way. And, yeah. and that's my that's my dream. And I think that you've equipped uh, a number of people here today through a lot of the learnings uh, to allow people to do that. And so oh, thank you, awesome, MJ. That's dude. That's why I love Brewview. That's exactly it. <laughs> I could feel it. I didn't know that, you know, I didn't know that was the whole thing, but uh, I could feel it in the air. And I think you're doing a great job, man. It, it's a lot of fun. I love being on here every week. 
And so let this be our wrap up here. And I will let uh, you say the final words to, to them. If there's any last piece of wisdom you want to give, and then I'll shout out who our next week's guest is. And we'll wrap it up here today. What is, Dude. What is the words of wisdom you'd like to pass off to the Kanama community through the review? Thank you. Um, like, thank you to everybody who has been a part of my life, my Kendama journey. Uh, that's just like promoting Kendama, you know, and like creating this, this beautiful community that we have. Um, thank you. I guess just like maybe you could putting it into like words of wisdom, just like to be gr grateful and like put that out and make sure people feel it, you know, that like you actually do appreciate them. Um, and that's, but that's, yeah, that's where, that's where I'm at is like, thank you. Thanks y'all. Dude. Thank you, MJ, for jumping on. This was a really great episode. And next week, we also have another really great episode coming up. Uh, we have one of Quill's newest team members jumping on the show, Whirly Rhea. Uh, Rhea's jumping oh. on. We're going to be chatting with her about her journey uh, with Kendama, how she's got on the Quill team, and some of the experiences that she's had in the Kendama community as well as of recent. And so I'm really excited for that one. And we got a whole crazy lineup of interviews all the way through March as well. Guys, uh, it's crazy. We're so booked out. It's so fun. There's so many cool episodes coming up. If you want to know what episodes are coming up, I usually release those details on the Patreon a month ahead of time. So make sure mm. you go support the show by leaving a like on this video, subscribing, following on the different podcast channels you listen on. It really does help get this show out there. Fun little statistic. We were really close to hitting what would be like the benchmark for a top 10% episode uh, last week uh, for downloads. In theory, we actually did it. Uh, but it only counts for podcast metrics. But we do this show via live. We get live listeners, viewers on IGTV, and the likes. Uh, if you do want to support via Patreon, like you were asking down in the chat, that is just $5 a month. And that gets you the behind-the-scenes access, priority questions, and insight into upcoming episodes. So thank you guys so much for being here. MJR, thank you for being on the review. And may thank your you never run dry. Mm. Thanks, guys. Cheers, brother. Talk yeah, cheers. Soon. Go get yourself a coffee. <laughs> and subscribe to Patreon. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Awesome. Well, thank you, MJR. Love your guys' support. And we will see you next week. Peace, peace.